Chapter 37 Determination A horse gallops on the muddied ground. Mud gets kicked up by its hooves as it races forward. The droplets glitter despite the gray sky. Swayme and Leffel reached the imperial capital, Philas Philia, a few days ago. Reiji, upon learning of Suwayme's crisis from Gregory, took off on a horse, leaving Mizuki and Titania to chase after. The two crossed the Nelfila, Aster border, and proceeded east of Clant City, where the road gives way to a vast forest of evergreens. Titania grips the reins of her horse as she gallops up to Reiji and expresses her relief, we got lucky and were able to borrow some horse along the way. If not for that, we never would have been able to catch up with you, Reiji-sama. Reiji ran off alone to save his friend, Swayme Yukagi, upon learning he was in danger. As a result, Titania and the rest of the party were left to chase after him. Thanks to good fortune, they were able to acquire horses on their way back to Aster and caught up to Reiji while he was resting. Reiji apologizes to her, thanks, but Tia, is that really okay? I'm out here following my own selfish whims. It's fine, this has nothing to do with Reiji-sama. The way things are, I have no choice but to go with you. Sorry, right now right now, this is Reiji's responsibility. Rushing out on his own wasn't wrong, but it did bring hardship to his companions. He's creating debts he'll never be able to pay back. Titania, however, dispels those doubts with a shake of her head and an unwavering smile. You're wrong. Reiji-sama, right now, you are mistaken. In the first place, it was an aristocrat from my country that deceived Swayme. Furthermore, my countrymen and I were also the ones who summoned you and your friends to this world. As a result, I, the Princess of Aster, am duty-bound to aid you. Therefore, Reiji-sama, you have no reason to feel indebted to me. Thanks, really, thank you. Don't worry about me. More importantly, Titania looked to the back from atop of her horse. The other girl at the end of her sight fills her with anxiety. Their selfish actions are dragging her into danger. Mizuki Mizuki still can't ride a horse on her own and clings to the female knight, Luka's, back. She follows them to face the Mizoku army without fear despite the fact that she still isn't used to combat and gets scared during battle. Reiji feels the same as Titania. Even though Mizuki's honest feelings raise his spirits, he say, Mizuki, don't push yourself. You'll lose the moment you think you can't fight. Mizuki claims to be fine. But. Knowing her friend is in danger, she'll never forgive herself if she left without doing something. The same sense of responsibility that shackles Reiji and Titania also binds her. Reiji wants Mizuki to turn back. He would never be able to forgive himself if anything happened to her. Mizuki, don't push yourself. This isn't just about Swayme. If something happens to you, I. Reiji Kuen. If we believe it's too dangerous, get to someplace safe with Lucasan, okay? Fine, I understand. But, what about you? You absolutely can't do anything too dangerous either. Reiji lies upon seeing the worry on Mazuk's face in order to relieve her feelings. Don't worry, I promise. The reason for his lie is obvious. That promise isn't one that can be kept. He has no doubt whatsoever of that. Titania makes an inquiry after Reiji and Mizuki finish. Reiji-sama, what are your plans? Right, I want to go to a place the Mazoku will pass by. I know we don't have time to waste watching them, but we still don't know where Swayme is. Once we confirm the size of the Mizoku army, I want to look for places where people could hide. Their primary goal is to rescue Suime. Fighting the Mizoku is pointless. The best plan of action is one that conforms to their goal. The odds of finding Suime along with the caravan are impossibly low. Regardless, Fufufu, when against Mizoku, should we not force our way through the front? That's your plan. Even I realize that that is extremely reckless. I also disagree. 
I'm really starting to get worried. Tia, did you flip a switch? You're a lot shrewder than this what happened. That is what I believe we should do. Considering out situation, that's our best plan of action. Reiji asks Titania to explain her words. Hey, Tia, if I said go on ahead, how would you respond? At that time, we have to strike together. Together? Reiji-sama, I told you back when we first set off. It is my obligation to accompany you. The moment you fall will also be the moment I fall. Reiji looks to the front to see what lies ahead. Everything before his eyes looks difficult, but now he can move past that. Titania's words give him strength. They were simple, but full of resolution. Her voice is a firm reassurance to keep pressing forward. After all, those words came from Titania, not some Tagalong girl. He was well aware that he might die when he first decided to do this. Now that she stands next to him, he needs to have that same resolution as her. Is something wrong? No, but Tia, you're incredible. I don't think I'll ever measure up to you. She doesn't grasp the meaning of his words. They came out of nowhere without any context. She tilts her head from atop of her horse in confusion. Titania, as the princess of an entire country, carries a stronger resolution than Reiji. Before her determination, anything he musters will be comparable to a puppy asking for affection. Looking at her stirs a deep sense of inferiority. Right now, however, isn't the time for such thoughts. Reiji reorganizes himself and asks, Tia, based on our plan, where do you think is the best place to go? Yes, from here we should first go north. The forest east of Clant is less dense in the north than in the south. It's also smaller, making that the best place for scouting the situation. I understand. Let's go. Chapter 38 The Great Nobleman Reiji rides his horse north. He hurries straight through the grove of trees instead of detouring around the mountain. Ominous gray clouds loom overhead. Even though he's surrounded and hidden by trees, the path forward fills him with both anxiety and a sense of danger. All he sees are shadows against an ash-gray background. As caution overtakes his recklessness, he slows down. Aster soldiers appear out of nowhere and block his path. The commanding officer says, Halt! Reiji pulls his horse's reins to avoid crashing into the soldier. Many horses can be heard neighing as they're forced to stop. The man directs a harsh tone towards Reiji and his party. Who are you? Answer me. We're. The senior knight, Gregory, steps forward as Reiji gives a meek reply and places himself between the two. Insolent fool! Who do you think you are? You dare obstruct Princess Titania and Yusha Reiji? What? Gregory's strict expression and thunderous voice shocks the soldiers. The faltering soldiers take nervous glances at the two Gregory mentioned and realize their mistake. All of them drop down and kneel towards Titania and Reiji. F.O. Forgive me. Please, accept my apology. Do not worry. Judging from your appearance, your soldiers stationed at Clant, correct? The soldier is grateful to Titania's leniency. Yes, we serve Duke Hadrias. The atmosphere within Reiji's party grows heavy at the soldier's response. Only Titania, thanks to years of practicing self-control, doesn't break her form. Duke Hadrias is here as well, correct? He is ahead with the main camp. Take us to him. The soldiers acknowledge the command with another, yes. Despite their nervousness, they encircle the party within a protective formation and lead them forward. Fresh leaves recently fall and crunch underneath the soldiers' boots as they march forward. Titania has her horse move with the formation. While Reiji does the same, Luca rides up to him. Mizuki, who sits behind Luca, leans towards Reiji for a private conversation. Reiji Kuen, about Duke Hadrias. 
Yeah, he's the guy who used Swayme as a decoy. I never thought he'd be here. AR are we really going to see him? Looks like it. They're off to meet their enemy. Reiji, upon narrowing his eyes, notices Mizuki turn stiff. Even though they're about to meet the person who tricked their friend, he cannot let his anxiety overwhelm him. Mizuki appeals to him with a face full of worry. Reiji Kuen, don't rush. Even with Tia, there's no telling what will happen if we involve ourselves with the aristocracy. Yeah, I understand. Thank you for worrying, Mizuki. Is she worried that I'll lose myself in anger and attack him? However, that won't happen. It won't. Gregory is who they should worry about. His concern as to whether or not he should say something is cut short. A clearing within the oak trees reveals an organization of knights, soldiers, and mages. Even though yesterday's rain muddied the ground and makes footing difficult, their resolution stands firm. Their sense of duty keeps them organized, a testament to their years of discipline. In the middle of the gathered soldiers, wrapped within the tension, stands an impressive figure in jet black armor. He's in his forties like Gregory, possibly younger. A large scar runs down the side of his face. Underneath it is a well-kept beard. His body, at about six feet of height, is wrapped with toned muscles. Despite his relaxed state, he exudes a natural aura of authority that makes those around him stand at attention. He feels like a general. The commander is notified of Reiji's party's arrival. After two or three words, the gathered knights and soldiers part to allow him a path towards them. Once he's before Titania, despite his impressive military power, he kneels without hesitation. Titania says, Please stand, Duke Hadrias. The commander, Duke Hadrias, rises at her words. Princess Titania, quite some time has passed since we last met at that evening party several months ago. It has been a while, Duke Hadrias. You look well, despite everything that's happening. Your Highness, this is nothing more than a cool spring breeze. I am Lucas D. Hadrias. While many consider this an unpleasant rain, to me it is but a cool spring breeze. This a cool spring breeze? That would make my concern needless. Everyone becomes speechless at the exchange between Titania and Hadrias. It's both amazing and painful to watch. The words Titania spoke after the greeting were like a slap to the face. Admitting she's acting like this because of friendship is difficult. Despite those feelings, Reiji's expression from atop of his horse is full of contempt. The silence filling the encampment creates a different type of tension. Even though her words are not spoken to offend, Hadrias neither receives them as jest or with a smile. He returns them in a quiet voice, as always, the words of your highness are quite sever. Is that man over there our summoned Yusha, Shana Reiji Dano? Yes. Hadrias turns towards Reiji with a composed expression. From within his eyes, however, he exerts an overwhelming sense of pride. This must be what Titania warned me about. With that thought in mind, he musters up his spirit and returns the stare. This guy. That man is the one responsible for setting up Swayme and the merchant caravan. He doesn't hold a shred of doubt over what he did. Instead, he stands there with his pride on full display. That inhuman plan infuriates Reiji. For now, he suppresses his anger and adopts a tranquil attitude. Hadrias closes his eyes and says, Excuse my late greeting, Yushidano. I am the one entrusted with His Majesty's Western Province, Lucas D. Hadrias. I caught wind that the Mazoka planned to invade our nation and came here to repel them. Out of arrogance, he both introduced himself and explained his reason for being there. Next he says, Princess Titania, our summoned Yushidano, why have you come here today? Reiji prepared a response to that question earlier. The Mizoku are more active here. The situation in Aster worried me so I hurried here from the Nelfila Empire. I see. You were forced to come all this way, my apologies. 
No, as the Yusha, this is my duty. Reiji uses a business-like tone and in no time joins Titania in questioning Hadrias. She says, Duke Hadrias, are the Mazoka further ahead? Taking our situation into account, I believe so. Then, once you finish here, do you plan on launching an attack? That depends on what my scouts report upon returning. Scouts, in other words, reconnaissance soldiers. Right now, judging by the number and formation of his soldiers, he looks ready to march an assault. However, there is a baffling disconnect between Hadrias's words and the image presented. It makes the conversation between Titania and Hadrias difficult to follow. Reiji says, to challenge the Mazoku isn't this force too small? The military force spread out before them is strangely small. There's only one to two hundred soldiers. At least one thousand soldiers should be required for this sort of operation. You should know, have peace of mind. This isn't the full force of my military. I have more forces in the north and south for a multi-pronged attack. Furthermore, I have set others aside for ambushes. I see. I suppose that was needless worry on my part. In truth, I plan to march my troops alongside those from metal. Even though we've combined our forces, the best plan was to divide ourselves. The situation around you has been carefully crafted. I've even taken the weather into consideration. That's why this is our current situation. Therefore, please forgive me for that. Reiji, upon hearing Hadria's explanation, tells him of his own plans. Once the scouts return, we'll head out as well. How inspiring. Yushidano, if you wouldn't mind, I would prefer if you just watch the battle's progress. Hadrias is sneering. Reiji is certain he sees the edge of Hadrias's lips curl upward. It's fine. Maybe it's all right for you to watch, but I am the Yusha. I have a duty to uphold. Foo, very well. I do not know what your purpose is, but if you're going to proceed into the middle of the Mazoku's forces, I'll accompany you partway. For the first time, Hadrias's expression crumbles and gives way to a daring smile. Reiji feels his body tighten like a string upon hearing those words. Their real reason for being there would be exposed if that guy is with them. He feels a strong urge to turn towards Gregory, but succeeds in keeping his eyes on Hadrias. Hadrias then says, for now, wait for the scouts to return, and returns to the center of his troops. Neither the princess nor Yusha are spared his rude treatment. As the situation is now, there's nothing they can do. Titania narrows her eyes and says, that person hasn't changed in the slightest. Both Reiji and the princess think the same thing as they glare at his back. How strange to hear you to speak like that. Do you hate him? It's just as you saw. Although I am unable to deliver false praise, I can present goodwill. That person, however, fuels antagonism through his condescending attitude and intimidating aura. The manner in which she gives her low evaluation is quite surprising. Tia, are you someone who hates losing? Huh? No. Well. Reiji-sama, now that you've met Duke Hadrias, what is your impression of him? Yeah, it was pretty surprising. He's some guy, huh? Reiji reveals his honest impression about Lucas D. Hadrias. Since that guy uses underhanded methods to manipulate others and is incredibly arrogant, he was expecting an aristocrat similar to a greasy tanuki. The reality is much worse. You'd think he's a sleazebag you won't be able to stand the sight off, but in truth, he's a never-ending cycle of viciousness. Hold on, Tia. I'm not going that far. You really hate him, don't you? Reiji-sama, was that enough for you? Today is the first time I've ever heard the term, guy, come from your mouth. Ah. What Titania points out is true. He spoke in such crude way without any forethought. He had intended to be careful with his speech around her, but his anger got the best of him. Confusion filled Mizuki's face. I, is that guy going to fight too? 
Isn't he a noble? Duke Hadrius comes from Aster's most prominent military family. Likewise, Duke Hadrius is distinguished arms master. Ragey isn't surprised. Upon considering the extraordinary sense of intimidation that he's naturally emitting, his willingness to come out onto the front line, and his well-sculpted figure, denying that he comes from a military background becomes impossible. Mizuki, however, makes a grim face as she misunderstands. He did have a deep scar across his face. Yes, that scar is an injury he earned in battle long ago. I've never seen him fight directly, but I hear his skills are very formidable. Titania speaks while skillfully manipulating her horse into turning around so she can face everyone. Then, while paying attention to anyone who might be eavesdropping, I'm sure you can see for yourselves that Hadria's Kyo isn't negligent. Reiji-sama, Mizuki, that person absolutely will never allow you to reach your own goals. That's why, Luca, Lofri, I ask the two of you for help. The two knights, yes. Come out like heartbeats. As for you, Gregory, please continue as you have been doing. But, Princess Haim. Do not worry. Hadria's Kyo may have enacted plans against you. I need you with me for my peace of mind. Dot Princess Haim my apologies. Gregory bows his head to Titania's reliable words. Lofri is so overcome with emotion that he turns around to hide his tears while Luca gazes at Titania with reverence. Tia, you're really cool today. Yeah, you really are. Even if you say such things, it won't do you any good? Huh? Um? Mizuki and Reiji are perplexed as Titania turns away with a puff at their compliments. Luca, who has been entrusting her back to Mizuki, has an expression similar to Reiji's. Several soldiers atop of horses gallop out from the forest. It's the scouting group that went to check on the situation. They make a straight line towards Hadrias in the center of camp with Reiji and his party close behind. Hadrias makes inquiries with his soldiers as they hurry to reach him. What's the situation of the Mizoku? Ha, ha, I'll tell you. The Mizoku army, sweat drips from the soldier's face as a gasp cuts between his words. Everyone except Hadrias pauses for a breath before listening to the soldier. They all wonder at how far the Mizoku have progressed. The soldier tells them, Ko, completely annihilated. The truth shocks everyone. Hum! Reiji's cries of joy and Hadrias's shock resound throughout the encampment. Reiji's astonishment can be seen even if his face is look at from the side. Total destruction. No one, not even Hadrias could have predicted such a report. Commotion stirs even among the surrounding soldiers as they too doubt the report. Ridiculous, the report stated there was over 1,000 Mizoku. Were they eliminated before clashing with the army? That's when Titania says, are you certain? Huh, well? The soldier gets confused at her presence. With Hadrias pressing him for a reply, he says, D, there's no mistake. The corpses of Mizoku littered the plain. How? A heavy silence fills the encampment as Titania's voice drifts off. The information isn't bad, but their circumstances were one where they doubted victory. No one can understand the development. Hadrias figures out what happened and turns towards Titania. Your Highness? Dot no, we came here from the Nelfila Empire. That's the opposite direction from which the Mazoku were spotted. Furthermore, what purpose would a small play like this even serve? That was a foolish question. Hadrias denies his own question as idiotic. He thought Reiji and his party annihilated the Mazoku. As a human from this world, he believes in the existence of the Yusha, humanity's hope. If it's about the Yusha, then nothing is impossible. That's something he must not allow himself to believe. While Hadrias is lost in thought, Titania says, Hadrias Kyo, we must investigate. You're right, let's go. Chapter 39 Traces, Exhausted and Written in Brush 
Reiji is taken by a feeling that they'll be seeing something incredible. The smell of iron mixing with a stench of something rotted chokes him as it assails his nose. Then, for some reason, the air turns warm. Goosebumps break out across his body. Can't the others feel it? Or am I just not used to it? Or maybe they're all pretending not to be able to see it? Is the calmness exhibited by the soldier only superficial? Are they hiding a maelstrom of nervousness deep inside? Only Hadria's remains steady fast. Titania's eyes betray her, they depict her nervousness. Reiji casts his gaze downward and rubs his eyes. The rainwater that flows out from underneath the leaves, maybe the light is playing tricks on him, but it sometimes flickers red. A sudden clearing appears through the trees. This is. Everyone hears Hadria's gasp. The situation is just like the scouts reported. Everyone doubts their eyes, but the scene before them is one littered with the corpses of Mizoku. What is this? Reiji too stares at the scene before him. It is beyond words. A terror-filled sigh escapes him. The scouts brought everyone away from the mountains to the vast plains where they see a deep fissure, ground that was melted due to being exposed to high temperatures now cooling and hardening, something like an iceberg jutting into the sky, an incomprehensible black marsh, and the uncountable remains of Mizoku. What the heck happened here? The bright sun shining through the clouds illuminates a scene no one would ever expect to see, a countless number of corpses. A natural disaster appears to have struck. No matter how you look at it, that's what this looks like. That's also the only way anyone can describe this. Reiji can still hear the Mazoka's agonizing death screams if he strains his ears. It's a gruesome sight. Even though they're Mazoku, the surrounding carnage evokes a sense of pity. It's a painting straight out of hell, it's hell on earth. With the scouts and soldiers leading the way, Reiji follows Hadrias from atop of his horse. This is a road, right? The straight path before their eyes is a blemish to the surrounding carnage. Only there is the destruction that surrounds them absent. There are no traces of blood or pieces of flesh. It's as if someone just forced his way through no, as if that person were determined to go that way. That person went straight to the foot of the mountain without hesitating or curving even once. The corpses of Mizoku lay scattered alongside the road's entirety. Mizuki mummers from the back, result of magic. Mizuki? I'm positive. Magic caused all of this. She speaks with complete certainty. She trembles as she surveys their surroundings and gestures to the unnatural iceberg and melted ground. They are the result of magic. You understand it well, Mizuki. No, really. There are faint remains of magic residue. The ice and molten earth still emit traces of their magical procedure. You're right. Reiji focuses his vision as he sharpens his senses. He too has, detect remnants. He didn't understand how to use it before, but now, the magical procedure is clear to him. It's like a thick cloud has been cleared away. However, the residue within the molten earth and ice hold a surgically precise magical procedure. Spells only need to be complicated enough to defeat Mizoku. Yet, the remains here are incredibly detailed, Mizuki, what is this? Yeah, whoever created these magical procedures is incredibly skilled. I can't understand them at all. It might not even be the same magic we're using. True, but a sophisticated technique like that, does it have any use except against large numbers like this? This isn't normal. The large Mizoku army was destroyed out of nowhere. The belief that this situation was impossible vanishes from Reiji's head. As impossible as it is, this isn't a situation in which two large armies clashed against one another. If two such powers did collide, then casualties would have been incurred from both sides. Instead, every corpse here belongs to the Mizoku. More importantly, before all that, where would such a powerful army even come from? Preparing such a military force and unifying it around a powerful spellcaster is impossible. 
Yet, it's that sort of overwhelming event that seems to have happened. The horses, sensitive to the tension everyone is releasing, cry out. Everyone, while attempting to soothe their restless horses, continues forward on the damp path. They hear Titania say, this is. Hadria's gasp follows hers as she stops to stare. He says, even a bay mass. Ragey and his party, prompted by Hadria's low groan, also investigate. It's the remains of an enormous Mizoku. It is huge. Mizuki screams. The body is no less than 200 meters long. To Reiji, its size invokes the image of a pitch-black cruiser. The massive beast possesses thick, leathery skin, limbs unproportioned to its body, and a giant horn. Its dimmed, large scarlet eyes are wide open in fright. A terrifying power caused it to freeze up in fear. According to Mizuki, the missing half of the demon's body was buried underground with magic. To take down a special, second-class demon fear captures Titania's heart. She names the demon's rank, but forgets to follow up with an explanation. She just breathes in and out because of shock. The bay mass is a substantial mimono compared to the surrounding Mizoku and mimono. The surrounding soldiers, Gregory and his knights, and Hadrias look at it with grim expressions. The remaining soldiers soon draw near and are also overwhelmed by astonishment. The weakening of knees that overcomes everyone is not from fatigue, but from incredibleness of their surroundings. Th this situation. As reported, the Mizoku have been annihilated. I'd say all of them are gone. Many soldiers speak with anticipation as they drop onto their knees and swallow their saliva. Hadrias maintains his stern expression. He refrains from putting on airs or saying anything foolish. Who did this? Ha, ha, there might be more than 10,000 here. That's when everyone forgets themselves. 10,000, no one doubts the number. Everyone roars in exhilaration. Once they return to their senses, Hadrias speaks his disbelief. Except, that figure doesn't appear to match the number of corpses? Tay 10,000. Another soldier says, as frightening as it sounds, the number is reasonable once the scope of the Mazoku's offense is calculated. Hadrias once more makes a grim face upon hearing the scout's words. His voice is one of surprise mixed with multiple emotions. Wasn't the estimate 1,000 before? Against that number, they would have mounted only a brief struggle. Even the most excellent strategy would falter against such an unimaginable number. Hadorias readjust his expression as Titania glances towards him. We miscalculated the Mazoku forces. I shiver at what might have happened had they attacked Metal or Clant. What happened here? When could this have occurred? Hadrias Kyo, do you have any ideas? Hadrias shuts his eyes as he considers Titania's questions. He soon arrives to an answer, I cannot think of a single person who might be responsible for this, but there was a furious thunderstorm seven days ago. I believe the Mazoka must have been eliminated then. During the thunderstorm. Hadrias continues his lie after Titania's murmur. He says, according to a bishop from the Salvation Church, the goddess was shaking with fury that day. That thunder may have been the embodiment heaven's fury. Could this really be Goddess Arushna's deed? Impossible, there's no way a convenient development like that could have happened. If such situations were possible, then there would be no need for Yusha. But this just deepens the mystery. With no idea as to what happened, all they can do is guess. During the middle of that conversation, Mizuki's anxious voice leaks out, Suemekuen, I hope you're okay. I hope so, too. Reiji is in complete sync with her anxious feelings. Just where is Suemei? It would be great if the Mazoku were eliminated before. Mazoku! There are survivors! Hum! Everyone turns around to look towards the warning. A soldier that was searching the area screams there are still Mazoku. The remaining Mazoku swarm the sky. 
whether they mix themselves among the corpses or are fling in from somewhere close by is uncertain. Hadrius draws his sword from atop of his horse as he issues quick commands to the surrounding soldiers, they're coming towards us. All hands, prepare for battle. They move without flaw. The soldiers armed with spears take formation to fend off the Mazoku while the spellcasters line up behind them and begin chanting. While Hadrius gives out orders, Reiji turns towards Luca. Luca san, protect Mazuki. Understood. Re Reiji kuen. I'm going to back them up. Mazuki, wait here with Luca san. Tia. Yes, Reiji sama. Reiji gives some quick orders and draws his sword. Tia, back me up with magic. Let's use our horses to attack from the side. There is a group of soldiers trying to ambush the Mazoku from the side. He rides his horse to the same place with Titania, Lawfrey, and Gregory following close behind. Meanwhile, Hadrius commands his soldiers left and right. The soldiers already have the Mazoku surrounded by the time Reiji and his party arrive. While a spearman restrains a leaping Mazoku, a spellcaster uses that gap to cast a spell. They have complete control over the situation. Not only do they demonstrate a magnificent grasp on both combat theory and tactics, each soldier also possesses a high combat ability. The way they are now, they're able to suppress the Mazoku without injury. Wrong. Despite what the situation looks like, the Mazoku are also desperate. With their main fighting force destroyed, they can't allow any more casualties. Casualties, they appear on battlefields. Their defeat has already been decided, but the amount dead continues to rise. This battle won't end until humanity's rejected enemy is eliminated. There is no turning back for the Mazoku. They do not fear death and all that awaits them is death. That's when the Mazoka deals a powerful strike against the soldier's stomach. The weapons of the fallen soldiers tell everything that happened on this dangerous battlefield. Before long, against enemies with no regard to their own life, the line crumbles and the soldiers are pushed back. The Mazoka rampage in their attempts to reach as many people as possible. As the soldiers are dragged into free-for-alls, their lives are endangered. Get back! Hadrius saves the lives of his soldiers by plunging his giant, black steed into the fray and bisecting the Mazoku before him with a single swing of his sword. Yet, despite his feet, several Mazoka slip through his sides. They're aiming for Luka and Mazuki. Shit! Reiji is on the opposite end of the field. It's already too late the moment he realizes that. The flying Mazoku are like jets. There's no way Luka will be able to fight properly while defending Mizuki. Even if Mizuki were to join, the battle would still be two against three. Gregory. Titania calls out on reflex, regardless of whether he can hear her or not. Gregory does turn his horse around, however, coo. Mizuki Dono, please, just hold on. Ye, ah, yes. Luca manipulates her horse into escaping from the Mizoku, but the muddy ground disrupts the horse's footing. The obstacle is minor, but in this situation, that small problem has deadly consequences. Balance is snatched away from the horse's footing as it stumbles. Damn, stain scarlet! With a swear, Reiji throws magic fire at the Mizoku. Titania follows up with her own spell, but fails to hit the suicide running Mizoku. This is bad. If nothing changes. The Mazoku fast approach Mizuki and Luka. Mizuki faces the Mazoku with her own magic, but only succeeds on setting them ablaze. The Mazoku do not die. Anyone who can help is too far away. Reiji feels a chill run down his spine. Something's happening. Reiji sees it with his peripheral. A tornado of white flame takes form and tears through the heavens. A pure white blaze envelopes the attacking Mizoku. The white flames scatter across the sky, incinerating all within. Eh? That magic! It can't be! 
Reiji and Titania cry out in shock and realization. What just happened? Right as Reiji discerns the answer, he hears the gallop of a horse. Someone is approaching them, and not at a normal speed. Could magic have been cast on the horse? It's as fast as a meteor. As a distinct figure comes into view, Titania cries out in joy. White Flame Dono. Riding on that horse is the one who called Reiji and his friends into this world. Clad in a pure white robe, the Imperial Court Magisterium, Felminia Stingray. Reiji shouts as he turns towards Felminia. Sensei. What are you doing here? You should dono. We can exchange stories later. There are still Mazoku remaining. Oh, of course. At Felminia's rebuke, Reiji turns his horse around and slashes his orichalcum sword at a Mazoku. While bisecting the Mazoku's top from its bottom, he hears Hatrias say, Spellcasters, prepare another round of magic. The army jumps into action at the powerful command. Soon, the soldiers skillfully drive back the Mazoku and the spellcasters exterminate them with their magic. Dirt and debris fly everywhere as a great number of spells explode. The rising smoke and steam lowers visibility of their surrounds. The Mazoku are annihilated and there are no signs of anything still alive beyond the veil of smoke and vapor. Felminia dismounts and pulls her horse along. Your Highness Heim, Reiji Dano, Mizuki Dano, a long while has passed since I have last heard from you. Titania closes her eyes and nods in appreciation as Reiji and Mizuki respond to Felminia's greeting. Long time no see, Sensei. Felminia-san, thank you very much. You saved me. Felminia takes Mizuki's hand within her own while saying, No, I was just passing by. But, I'm so glad I was. Mizuki smiles and thanks her again. Felminia turns towards Hadrias. They exchange a few words and he lowers his head. Are the two acquainted with one another? Their words are businesslike, but her tone carries the same repulsion as Titania's. Titania once more expresses her appreciation. White Flame Dono, you have my gratitude. However, what brings you to this place? Fumu, have you not heard? His Majesty has relieved me from my position as the Imperial Court Magisterium. Felminia maintains a humble expression as Hadrias joins the conversation. Ha, huh, instead of fulfilling the duties of Imperial Court Magisterium, I am currently acting under His Majesty's direct orders. By Imperial Command. Felminia being relieved from her duties as the Imperial Court Magisterium surprises Reiji. If this was a direct order from King Almadias, that means, were you asked to come help us? No, I was not. White Flame Dono, what are your orders? Hum. Felminia doesn't answer Titania's question. Could the decree be so severe that she can't answer the princess's question? Well, it is an order from the king. A breathless soldier runs up to them during the middle of their conversation. Ho reporting. Tensions run high as everyone wonders if any Mazoku remain. Reports are coming from all around, even the forest, but no Mazoku have been found. Hadrias asks the soldier a question, what happened? D. The Empire's third princess, Graziella Filas Razeld broke through our border with a squad of soldiers. It's an emergency report. The soldier chokes as he reports the information. Titania's face twists in terror as she says, Her Highness, Princess Graziella. Ha ha! Her Highness forced her way across Aster's national border without notifying any of the station troops. They've already passed Clant and are coming here. For what reason? Isn't that obvious, Hakumaidano? Nah. A voice brimming with authority forces itself into the conversation. Titania turns in shock towards it and finds a woman crossing through the smoke. Chapter 40 the Imperial Princess and Mizuki whispers, Reiji Kuen, we don't know these people. What should we do? 
Reiji tries to calm Mizuki who's getting affected by the serious mood, whatever we do, I just hope it's something we can handle. Despite those words, he's doubtful. They're not in any position to do anything. Before Reiji's eyes is a young woman riding atop of a horse. She makes her way through the smoke with a challenging voice. With wavy long, blonde hair and lips raised up in a daring smile, she possesses the stern eyes born to those who reign over others. She's dressed in luxurious military gear with her coat hanging from her shoulders. Everyone in her entourage is equipped with the same gear. Are they her companions or subordinates? Regardless, the situation is worrisome. Has anyone noticed their horses? They're riding horses just like Reiji and his companions, yet the hoofs of their horses don't make any sound upon hitting the ground. When considering their number and how close they are, it's an impossible outcome. Reiji is so caught up in his question that he murmurs it aloud. Felminia overhears him and whispers her guess. Reiji Dano, that lady is the Nelfila Empire's third princess, Her Highness Graziella Filas Razeld. She is known as the Geomail Ficus, Emperor of Earthquakes, the Empire's strongest earth attribute spellcaster. Something like erasing the sound of hooves stomping might not be any trouble for Her Highness. Why would she want to erase the sound of footsteps? I also do not know. Judging from the situation, they do not have the intention to attack us. While Reiji and Felminia discuss Graziella's motives in private, Titania approaches Graziella with a firm expression. Even though there's a prevalent atmosphere of doubt and anger, Titania extends a courteous greeting. It has been a long time, Your Highness, Graziella. It really has, Your Highness, Titania. You're still as long-winded as ever. Graziella heavy-handed reply that disregards the current situation irks Titania. Your Highness, you mentioned your reason for being here is self-evident. What exactly did you mean? Oh. You need an explanation? How about you explain the situation to me? We may be in an alliance, but you still crossed our national border without prior notification. Furthermore, you even brought along a squad of soldiers. Such outrageous conduct warrants an explanation. Graziella counters Titania's firm stare with a dark expression. Certainly, such actions do warrant explanation. However, is this such a situation? What do you mean? What part don't you understand? Their glares clash. Graziella then turns her nose as she says, Didn't Mizoku invade your country? Not only did you not consider the possibility of damage spreading to neighboring countries, you neglected to inform your ally country of this development. What kind of alliance is this? That. The Mizoku invasion was too sudden. We did not have enough time to inform anyone. Yet you are prepared to engage them. Not only that, both you, someone who should be in my country, and Aster's Yusha knew to come here. There is no excuse to not having contacted us. Or is Aster Kingdom's Princess Dono nothing more than a pretty face? Titania's expression distorts. Psu. Graziella laughs through her nose. She draws satisfaction from her own rudeness. Well, you only stopped by my country because you are on your way to defeat the Demon King. You not being aware of current domestic affairs is pretty reasonable. That is why. That is why you are having me stay silent on this matter. Your Highness, you are the one who entered my country with neither permission nor proper justification. My understanding is that I rushed here to rescue my country's ally. Such circumstances more than justifies my actions. Should you not overlook this breach in protocol? Did she come to help? Such would mean she was trying to sneak up on the Mizoku from behind. Such a situation does make sense after thinking about it. Titania's bitter expression, however, doesn't change. She keeps glaring at Graziella. Dot, I will officially protest this matter later. She brushes aside Titania's complaints without any hesitation. That sounds good, but this matter is one regarding a Mizoku invasion. 
Do you not agree that the Sardius Alliance, the Autonomous State, and Holy Order would probably take my side? How thick-skinned is she? She then turns towards Reiji. Her piercing stare seizes him from his head all the way down to his toes. Are you Aster's summoned Yusha? Yes. What an unsocial person. Reiji gives a light bow with his head. This is my natural disposition. She isn't an opponent to whom he can show any openings. Graziella accepts his explanation and laughs while staring at Reiji's face. You have a beautiful face. Come again? A good face unblemished from a single scar. Is the other world free from conflict? As the man we call Yusha, you do not look dependable. She is very bold to say such things on their first meeting. What an unreasonable girl. The remark angers Titania. Your Highness, Graziella, this man is the Yusha who came to save the world. Is that not what is said? Hum. That is what I thought up until now, too. But this disaster scene does not look like something just anyone could accomplish. Everyone glances towards Titania at that remark. What happened to the Mazoku forces? Well, we are not sure. I also want to know what happened. Graziella frowns at Titania's explanation. Hum? I also do not know what happened, nor do I know how to explain this. Even though they're her honest words, she does not want to speak them. As Reiji thought, she really hates losing. That's when Reiji realizes that Hadrias is watching the situation unfold from the side. He came here for some reason, but hasn't done anything other than watch. He's been too quiet since Graziella arrived. Taking his personality and position into account, he's probably been trying to get in a word or two. Looks like not even an Aster noble like him can mount a protest against that girl. What are you thinking about behind that mask you wear? Is it different from the image I projected at the beginning? Except, something about it feels unnatural. An incident occurs while Reiji harbors these doubts. Everyone looks around upon noticing a strange, rising wave of power. It's a powerful surge of magic power. Felminia, however, looked upward at the very beginning. Her long silver hair shakes as she says, that's. Was she the first one to spot it? Hadrias says while glaring at the Mazoku zipping towards them. There's still one left. It's stronger than the Mazoku we just fought. Reiji finishes the thought. Everyone gets ready to fight. Each of them feels just how dangerous the situation is becoming. The approaching Mazoku is bursting with magical power. The Mazoku they battled against up until now can't compare to this one. That dangerous Mazoku is headed straight towards them. Just like the previous Mazoku, it rushes to slaughter humans the moment it sees any. The horses won't stay calm. Reiji stays vigilant, but lets out a low grunt as he dismounted from his horse. The others also dismount. That the Mazoku arrives goes without saying. A flash of light strikes the ground before everyone's eyes. Accompanying the thunderous explosion is a spray of rocks and dust. A cloud of smoke fills the area once more. A hard wind strikes them and magic power assails them like a fine rain. A huge demon more than two meters tall and wrapped in rust-red skin comes into view. Its thick limbs and robust body are like an expression of its magical potency. Band of Humans Have you gathered your strength? Who huge, someone gasps upon seeing the Mazoku's massive form. Reiji-sama Don't let your guard down. Reiji narrows his eyes at the Mazoku at Titania's warning. Yeah, Tia, I understand. Just. Even though the Mazoku radiated unparalleled power during its flight here, it's actually covered in wounds. A shaky black aura is emitted from the scars riddling its body. This Mazoku isn't at its best. Even he can see that it's exhausted. From the magical residue, this Mazoku seems to have taken part in a fierce battle. 
No, there's no mistaking that that is what happened. This Mazoka came here after a life or death battle. It's weakened, yet its magical power is astounding. Judging from the wind pressure it creates, this Mazoku is still a formidable adversary for all of us. Hadrias asks the imposing Mazoku a question. Just what kind of a bastard Mazoku are you? I, I am called Rajas, one of the demon generals to the Mazoku army. Both Titania and Graziella gasp upon hearing Rajas name himself. A, a demon general. Who, what a big shot. Hadrias keeps his gaze sharp on Rajas during that commotion. You look like you've had a hard time. What kind of fight did a bastard like you get into before reaching here? Silence, that doesn't concern any of you Rajas rebukes Hadrias. Pain from its wounds isn't the only thing that leak into his voice, it's also laced with anger at the one who defeated it. Rajas prepares for battle while speaking. He wants to strike first? Everyone raises their weapon in response. The Mazoka general, however, loses its chance when Reiji says, I want to ask you something. What? Why do you attack humans? The Mazoka must have a reason for attacking humanity and that's something Reiji wants to learn no matter what. Raja speaks after making a strange expression. Fuen, that's just how it is. Human society is an infestation that we want to exterminate. Human society? An infestation? Do you feel that way about all life? You humans are different, you're like a never-ending swarm of maggots. The way you developed into a society ticks us off. Exterminating you is only natural. Aren't humans and Mazoko both living creatures? Isn't using such a justification to kill one another pointless? Is that all you want to say? Just that. Reiji truly wants to know why humans and Mizoku had to fight, he wasn't trying to make light of the situation. However, only idiots believe that all conflicts can be resolved by understanding one another through dialogue. If that were true, then conflict would have never existed. Regardless, Reiji still wants to know. If there is no reason to fight, then they should stop. He isn't claiming that they should clasp hands in friendship, but that life would be better if they could respect each other's autonomy. He hears an anxious sound from Titania and a snort from Graziella. Despite that, this is the outcome Reiji desires. Rajas then tosses an inquiring gaze towards Reiji. Are you the Yusha bastard? Does that change anything? Rajas makes a bold declaration despite the obvious wounds rampaging around his body. Coo. Cuckoo. I see. You said some naive things, but... This all works out for me. With this, I can finally accomplish my original mission. Graziella releases a condescending laugh at the Mazoku's determination. Care to repeat that, Mazoku? You are already pretty beat up. Such a nosy person. Well, I can't just leave with the way things are now. Yusha, I'll be compensating for my blunder by claiming your neck. Don't get ahead of yourselves, humans. Rajas once again raises his magical power for the impending battle. Reiji points his sword at the Mizoku. Hadrias and his soldiers do the same. Mizuki falls to the back where Titania stands ready for a command to unleash her magic. Felminia follows the flow and positions herself at the side. Graziella, however, watches the event unfold. She doesn't uncross her arms or give any indication that she intends to fight. The arrogance she carries herself with, whether because she's accustomed to battle or not, remains unchanged. Reiji says, hey, what about my question? Enough with your talk, you shaw. Rajas moves. The gigantic, two-meter-tall Mazoku speeds towards Reiji. With a roar, it goes even faster. Reiji springs forward and matches Rajas's speed. Kuu, he achieves a speed unthinkable in the previous world. He soars above Rajas and swings his sword. Ha-ia! 
Rajas meets Reiji's sword with a fist and, with a kiai, shakes it off. Reiji's arm is rattled by the impact, but he still manages to keep hold over his sword. Rajas' fist rivals Reiji's two-handed swing which is being boosted by the divine protection blessed upon him during his summoning. This is Rajas' exhausted state? What's his 100% like? Rajas throws a side punch while Reiji is still in midair. It's an attack that ignores the power Reiji placed behind his sword. Reiji squats down as he lands and Rajas' palm strike flies right over his head. Reiji, out of pure instinct, grips the ground with a hand and pulls himself away. A swung hand bounces off the mud. Reiji protects his head with his sword and then steps forward with a strike, but Rajas gives a vigorous stomp. Yua! Reiji's balance collapses as the strong impact that shakes the earth coincides with his step in. Rajas then rams its enormous body into Reiji. Ri Reiji Kuen. Mizuki, I'm fine. Don't worry. Reiji stands back up even though he feels as though a jolt of electricity ran through his body. For some reason, Rajas shouts at him in anger. So this is the Yusha's power. You're standing against the ambition of the Mizoku with just that? Ridiculous. What is going through Raja's mind to be so frustrated and disappointed? Reiji feels as though he's being compared to someone else. Raja's moves to attack Reiji again, but Hadrias shields him. Get out of the way! Hadrias stands against Raja's deafening roar with silence and dodges the Mazoku's flurry of punches as though it were a game of touch. Hadrias, with the way he moves, may as well be in the prime of his life. Then, upon finding an opening, cuts a deep gash across Rajas's chest. Goo! Whereas Rajas twists his face at receiving the cut, Hadrias looks bored. A scornful sigh even escapes his nose. Fu in. That imposing Mizoku is weaker than Hadrias? Che! Human! Even though Hadrias brushed Rajas off like a bug, he leaps back to create some distance between themselves. A sound similar to a woman's shriek rings out. Take, Graziella uses that timing to release a sneak attack. Was she quietly waiting for an opportunity like this? She gallops forward while casting a spell. Ground! This is the crystallization of my majesty. I shatter authority with my own hands. The stone monument erected in tribute to the fallen. Crystal Raid Graziella strikes the ground beneath herself as she chants her spell in front of Rajas. A small tremor occurs and the ground surrounding her crumbles. A countless number of stone protrusions made from quartz and selenite jut upward from where she struck. They branch out and rush Rajas. She uses her hard and heavy magic to accelerate the sea of razor-sharp rocks into that of cannon fire. They crash into Rajas, now, a black aura coiled around his body just before they made contact. Rajas is buried underneath the sea of stone pillars. The stones soon crumble and from underneath emerges Demon General's figure, unchanged. It had no effect? Rajas' massive body is revealed unharmed as the black aura dissipates. Was that aura some sort of defensive technique? It offers a very powerful protective ability, that spell was at the very least intermediate level. Their usual attacks won't be any good against it. However, Graziella's surprise is just as surprising. She expected her attack to at least do something. That is when, oh! Rajas releases a war cry. The Mazoka forcibly draws power from the depths of its heart with a yell that appears to cut into its own life. From his right hand swells a refined dark energy which then explodes and swallows everything around it. The dark energy mixes with the shockwave and blasts towards them. Reiji's mouth dries as he reconfirms the distance between himself and Raja's attack. Not good. Between it and everyone else is only 10 meters. Furthermore, there's a lot of power within that blast, getting hit by it is dangerous. He still can't feel his body, he can't move, and defensive magic won't make it on time. 
the sense of anxiousness that overcomes him chills his blood and numbs his arms. Yet, when a person is at their wit's end and out of time, the body moves on its own. Reiji-sama, watch out! Ha! Huh? Tia! As soon as he noticed the voice coming from his side, the scenery changes. The fear in Titania's voice jolts Reiji's brain. Now that he's aware, he notices that she's holding him within her arms. He needs to reorganize his thoughts. Did she just rescue me? He's suddenly very far away from Rajas. Was that magic? That rescue really was by a hair's breadth. Rajas speaks with a raspy voice as he gasps for breath. His lungs sound like they are crying. Damn. Even after using all my power. Is this because of that false thunder? A very potent poison must have been used against Rajas. The Mazoku's body was struggling against it, but the anger fueling Rajas has finally succumbed to the pain. There is a surge of magic power in their surroundings, followed by an explosive output of spells as every spellcaster casts magic. Rajas is soon enveloped within several attributes of magic. The attributes, fire and lightning, don't negate each other and instead merge. The combination of so many powerful spells results in a magic stronger than what Graziella cast. Yet, Rajas still lives. None of the spells affect the Mazoku. Titania gasps, dot such a tenacious Mazoku. Goo, you. Just how tough is that Mazoku? Hadrias is the only one who managed to wound it. Rajas moans out in pain. The Mazoku had quite a bit of damage to begin with. Looks like death is finally reaching out to it. Don't falter. Spellcasters, keep casting. Hadria's roar fills their surroundings.